Thank you, Myra. Um, we're going to move on to Trevor Stratton. And so, um, diagnosed with HIV in 1990, Trevor is a citizen of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation near Toronto. He's uh, the coordinator of the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV AIDS, coordinator for the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, and a North America N NGO delegate on the UN AIDS Program Coordinating Board. That's a lot. <laughs> um, his work is international in scope, but he has a special focus on Canada, where injection drug use is driving the HIV and Hep C epidemics among indigenous populations. The Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network is the first NGO on the UN AIDS Board focused on uh, indigenous people. And this morning, Trevor is here to share his experience as a harm reductionist advocating for indigenous people. Welcome. Thank you very much, Monique. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Ganawake Mohawk people. And I'd like to acknowledge our elder, Sedalia Sego, Ani. Um, I am from Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Uh, my mom was born and raised there. And uh, my dad is fifth generation English Canadian. But I also have, in addition to Ojibwe blood, I have Mohawk blood, I have French blood and English blood. So that's, that's a lot of fighting in, in Canadian history. All those groups fought together in various wars and, and all that blood is, runs through my veins. Um, what I do now really is what everyone's doing and fighting for uh, you know, the principle of nothing about us without us. And that is for indigenous people as well. If you're gonna have a women's conference, you don't have a committee of only men with no women to, make, to, to plan the conference. It's just uh, common sense that is not applied um, to uh, a lot of the groups that, that we deal with, including people who use drugs. Uh, a lot of times we have to justify why we should be consulted at all. What do you have to offer? What do you bring to the table? So that's what, uh, that's what we fight for is indigenous people at the table because if you're not at the table, you could be on the menu. You won't know unless you're there. <laughs> There's over 600 First Nations in Canada. It's extremely diverse. In addition to First Nations people, we also have Inuit uh, Aboriginal people and Métis Aboriginal people. And all of us live uh, the legacy of colonization. Colonization did a lot of damage and put our, our health at risk and put our people at risk and caused a lot of uh, trauma to, um, to our communities and to our people. But it's not just the people who directly experienced it, it's the multi-generational trauma that's passed down through families and through culture that we, we experience to this day. I, I want to um, really, I guess, what we're talking about is, is the, an issue of trust. And, and that is a central a tenet of harm reduction as well. And in Canada, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Committee uh, Commission, which I would, I would argue is a, um, a best practice. That, that's something that's very important. For one thing, to hear the Prime Minister of Canada apologize for residential school systems where Indigenous children were taken from their families and communities and taken hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometers away and put in um, religious institutions that um, showed very little compassion and love for human beings, to be quite honest. And through this Truth and Reconciliation Commission is where the action was taken after the apology. And, and so uh, some of those, one of those recommendations is to recognize the traditional territory of indigenous peoples when you, ha when you bring people together. So thank you very much for, to the Harm Reduction Conference here, HR 17, for, for acknowledging and following one of the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. That, that, that is very important to um, regaining the trust of indigenous people. But it's also uh, our nation states and our governments that uh, don't have a lot of trust for indigenous people um, most nation states look at our, the citizens as uh, production units, units of production to contribute to the gross national product. And indigenous people and communities don't really view their citizenry that way. It's, it's sort of a how, how do we live the best way 
how can we live in, in the best way and be the, good, the best example to our, to our families and to our, to our communities. And, to, and walking, walking in a good way is, is, a, is a really good way to support people. If you, if you want to um, understand someone who, who may need to be connected to the healthcare system, it's important to just walk with them, listen to them, and, and understand where they're at, where are they coming from, what, what, what are they ready for? You know, and, and when, we, when we deal with communities, what I've learned is that, that community readiness is important too. With 600 First Nations and such diversity in Métis and Inuit people, it's important to understand where a community's at. And, and when, we in, when we talk about harm reduction, it's important to talk about harm reduction within our cultural frameworks that are, already exist, because our traditional values are, are perfectly aligned with, the, with the, um, the values of harm reduction in terms of um, the autonomy of the individual. And everyone has their own truth, and it's really about helping people to find their truth. Because my truth may not be your truth, your truth may not be my truth, and yet it is our truth. So to, find, to help someone find their truth is really what, how we look at harm reduction, is not to judge people. I don't know if you've ever heard the expression to walk a mile in the moccasins of someone before, uh, before even trying to understand, just be there w with them. You know, a lot of our um, response to addictions came from uh, abstinence-based programming over um, alcoholism and alcohol use in our communities. And so a lot of the alcohol and drug workers in our communities, uh, they, we really respect lived experience in indigenous communities. So someone that has gone through it and, and, and is, is on a path toward their own healing is very well respected as, as a, a drug and alcohol worker. But many of them, their experience is in alcohol. And, and the experience in the culture around alcohol is a lot different than, than, than drugs. And each drug, the culture around the drugs and the rituals and the ceremonies that go with drugs are very easily um, substituted. Um, those are very easy substitutes for our ceremonies and our traditions. When people get together and you, know, you work it and you roll it, and you, there's all this ritual and ceremony involved. Um, and that, that really rings true for indigenous people. And, and get, getting people back to their, um, to their own belief system is very important. And that doesn't necessarily mean digging back five or 600 years to go to look at traditional spiritualism in indigenous communities. That is important for many of our people, but uh, many of our people are also very Christian or they have their own beliefs. So to walk with them and to create um, um, uh, interventions that are culturally appropriate and appropriate to the stage of readiness of the individual, but not only the individual, the stage of readiness for the community. And there are models. There's the uh, community readiness model from the Tri-Ethnic Research Center at the University of Colorado. It's been around for about 15 years, but it's very good for helping to communities to assess their readiness to um, implement a given uh, or react, or respond to a given issue. And I traveled around the country helping communities to assess their readiness for addressing harm reduction. And the first question I'd ask is, who's heard of harm reduction? And it, would, it was usually less than 50% in the room. Sometimes two hands went up. So we'd have to, and then I'd talk about who's, who knows that, what HIV AIDS is, and a lot of people didn't. So because we're in the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, we'd have to start at the very basics. Figure out where they're at, what do they know, and start there. So that's, that's always been, um, that's always been our approach. And, you know, and the, the intersection between culture, law, and religion um, is, is key when dealing with indigenous peoples. For, for many years, our traditions were outlawed. Our languages were, were illegal. Our ceremonies were illegal. And those people who retained those ceremonies, they, they were the people who went back into the bush and practiced the ceremonies. So, so for example, our, our respect and our place of honor for our two-spirit people or LGBTI community is thousand, a thousands of years old tradition where we had ceremonies and dances and even dialects. Our people had, our, our middle people had this. And so, you know, getting, uh, having those uh, traditions outlawed has been very traumatic for our communities. And, when, when public health or when people come knocking on the door saying, we've got the solution for you, knock, 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 I've, I got a pill, we'll fix your community. 
there's a lot of distrust and, and so many well-intentioned people have come and done research and not shared the research, taken it away, and sometimes even used it against our people. So there's a lot of mistrust in institutions, in hospitals, in schools, in prisons, in military, um, in hospitals. A lot of the institutions that most um, people in Canada would consider to be you know, on their side, uh, we look at it as, as, as you know, mechanisms that have caused a lot of hurt. And I can use the, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with their beautiful red uniforms and those hats. When most Canadians look at them, they think of the, the good heart and the well-meaning um, helper. And our communities, often they're viewed as baby stealers and people who take our people away and put them in prison. And so, you know, when, when you ask uh, an Indigenous person to to um, respond or to talk about Canada's 150th anniversary or Montreal's 350th anniversary, please take, take a moment to just try to understand where we're coming from and how we think of this legacy of, of colonization and of uh, newcomers um, and, and, and settlers coming to our communities and, and how all of our laws were changed and a system uh, that doesn't fit our people has been imposed upon us and, and with that residential school and the multi-generational trauma, that's what you're dealing with when you're speaking to an indigenous person who, who may be using drugs. These are, this is some of the context we have to take into consideration. Um, we've done a, a lot of work in Canada around HIV and AIDS and around uh, harm reduction in indigenous communities, but it, uh, under the conservative government, they, they um, so they didn't allow us to even mention the word uh, harm reduction or uh, submit any, any projects around harm reduction. So it, it really set us back in terms of harm reduction, but there are some amazing work happening in the communities. It's just that on a national level, we haven't, um, we've, we've really lost a lot of um, time uh, being conducting and helping people to get on the same page to share these best practices. And yet, we are resilient. We're still here. It's, Pretty amazing. Not only that, we're working internationally. Um, as Monique said, we, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network holds a seat on the program coordinating board at UNAIDS. Now they're actually saying the word indigenous. They're considering uh, indigenous peoples as maybe a key affected population for HIV and AIDS and hepatitis C. They, they, we have the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York where we go and we interact and we uh, ask them to work with UNAIDS, so we're trying to pull them together. We're trying to get the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to be integrated through United Nations systems such as UNAIDS and others. Um, and we've just incorporated a new international indigenous HIV AIDS community and we are a full partner of the Central Coordinating Committee of uh, the International AIDS Conference in a Amsterdam coming up next year. But getting back to Canada, indigenous people do have a lot to celebrate. We can celebrate our culture. We can celebrate the strength of our resilience and the fact that we're still here. And you know what? Our population is growing. It's the fastest growing population in Canada. So we're currently 4% of the population, but we're soon to be more. Um, right here in Montreal, the, native, the Montreal Native Women's Shelter is doing some, some excellent work in harm reduction and in, in reaching our indigenous people, um, women living with HIV and AIDS and just um, taking that harm reduction approach and starting where people are at. And I would, I would say, and I think all indigenous people are, are agree that women are the backbone of our nations. If our women fall, we're all doomed. Thank you. <laughs>